and the presentation. It's this one, and let's open this one. Right, so now you should be able to see my title slide. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, um, in many ways, my talk will actually follow up uh, on what Christoph just told us about. It'll expand on one or two of the ideas or rephrase them slightly, I suppose. Um, so let me start by discussing the choice of title. I decided to talk about constructing machine learning potentials for biomolecular systems. And in, in this choice of title, I've basically made the claim that this is no longer the daunting task that it uh, used to be. But uh, probably more apt title would have been a subtitle, which is standing on the shoulders of giants, because you'll find out in a moment that what I'm proposing is basically playing Lego with pre-existing building blocks. Um, and that's what actually makes uh, constructing these MLPs for uh, molecular crystals in particular, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, before I get to that, uh, why organic uh, materials and why organic molecular crystals in particular? I suppose they are of particular scientific interest uh, simply because of their quite wide uh, technological uh, relevance. So for instance, uh, they are the key component in sustainable wearable uh, organic uh, photovoltaics. They're also the most common form in which uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, are synthesized. Um, and even though the molecules themselves are the pharmaceutically active components, um, the solubility and therefore the delivery and effectiveness of drugs depends on the crystal form. Uh, there are plenty of other examples, but for the purpose of this workshop, it's probably more interesting to discuss what makes them difficult to simulate. And in order to get a bit of an idea of that, we can turn to something as simple as glycine. Um, glycine is kind of characteristic in that it's polymorphic in crystalline form. So there are different crystal forms which compete for stability and they differ in free energy by really minuscule amounts. Um, here I'm showing you the alpha, beta, and gamma form that kind of all metastable at ambient conditions. Um, it's also a flexible molecule and it ex exhibits a, a fair bit of cell fluctuations. It, it's, some, uh, it's a material that undergoes a fair bit of thermal expansion. Um, on top of that, we've got nuclear motion, which is quite strongly anharmonic, even if the nuclei are treated classically, which isn't to say that nuclear quantum effects don't play a role. Uh, they do, and so when you simulate for example, glycine, but many other organic molecular crystals, you have to perform path integral simulations. And given the somewhat complex nature of the intermolecular and intramolecular bonding, you end up having to do that with probably post semi-local DFT accuracy. So um, long story short, um, simulating these organic molecular crystals tends to uh, involve uh, rigorously dealing with the quantum statistical mechanics of the nuclei in the cell and doing so at a very accurate description of the electronic structure. So we need uh, machine learning potentials, which are not only very accurate, they need to be capable of dealing with very system densities and they're probably gonna have to be constructed on rather few because quite expensive training data. And so after the last few days, and if you look at some of the points on this uh, flow chart, then um, you'd probably be forgiven for thinking that um, this has to involve a fair bit of expertise and it's going to be a bit of a tricky proposition, but I'm going to argue that it doesn't have to be. Um, so what's going to make organic molecular crystals particularly simple? Well, in a nutshell, it's that we have a affordable, robust, and physical baseline potential that we can use to, first of all, uh, acquire suitable training configurations that we can uh, use to uh, minimize the number of training data that we need to compute and that we can ultimately use as a fallback potential to stabilize our simulations. But bear with me while I try and illustrate a bit the, the benefits of having such a good approximate potential. So next bit of my talk is essentially going to be about the idea of delta learning. 
Um, let us start by assuming that we don't have a approximate potential. And that leaves us having to directly fit whichever potential we're interested in. So in this case, it's going to be some sort of uh, hybrid functional D of T or maybe quantum chemical uh, potential energy surface. And here in this simple example, in this 1D example, let's do we want to fit, let's assume that we want to fit that on the basis of these eight uh, reference data points. If we're lucky, we might end up with a fit that looks a bit like this gray curve. But if we're less lucky, we might also end up with either of these uh, curves indicated in red, which subject to the details of our fitting approach are just as consistent with the reference data. And if we now briefly assume that this structural coordinate that I've put on the x-axis is going to be something like an interparticle distance and that we're actually looking at a, a pair potential, then they illustrate quite nicely what often goes wrong with simulations. Um, if we look at them separately, then on the left-hand side here, we've got the case where we've got a lack of uh, short range uh, repulsion, which favors particle coalescence. Um, this is not a very uncommon scenario, especially if one uh, uh, acquires training configurations by means of sampling the thermodynamic ensemble, because uh, configurations with very close particles are typically high energy and therefore uh, are rarely sampled. And so they're likely to be uh, underrepresented under -represented or not represented at all in, in, in thus generated training data. I think on Monday, we briefly proposed explicitly including them. Um, in general, if one does this for say condensed matter systems and high dimensional configuration spaces, this tends to be futile um, a, a thing to attempt. We'll, we'll get back to how one can get around this in a bit. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side, we've got in some sense the opposite scenario there, we're getting the long range behavior wrong. And this is particularly problematic when we uh, are interested in performing isobaric simulations, which due to the cell flexibility and thermal expansion that we have in organic molecular crystals will be, uh, will be what we'll have to do. Because in isobaric simulations, the system can arbitrarily expand and effectively evaporate if we get this long range. Uh, interaction incorrect. So a common scheme for suppressing these kinds of instabilities basically hinges on understanding or realizing that the behavior for very short interparticle distances and very long interparticle distances is, is actually qualitatively well uh, reproduced by very simple two-body pair potentials, so maybe something like Leonard-Jones potential. And the simple trick is to delta learn on top of them. So to instead of learning the black target potential here, to try and learn the difference between the black target potential and the simple red baseline potential. Now, if we regularize our fit suitably, then our resultant delta learning machine learning potential should be well behaved in the extrapolative region. And the combined potential, so baseline plus uh, machine learning potential, should retain the correct uh, limiting behavior for very small and very large um, interparticle distances. But the two problems in some sense that remain, uh, one is the thermodynamic distributions of configurations uh, of the baseline potential and the target potential are very different, are gonna, generally gonna be very different. And so we can't sample informative training configurations using the simple baseline potential. And to the uh, effective potential energy surface that we're trying to fit is still going to show roughly the same fluctuations, at least in the relevant regions, as the original one. And so we're likely going to need a similar number of training data to achieve a given accuracy. Now, this changes quite a bit if we happen to have a more physical and more accurate approximate baseline potential. If we have that, we can not only use it to generate uh, training configurations. We can make also make sure that the limiting behavior is correctly reproduced. And because we're now effectively trying to fit something a lot smoother and more slowly varying, we're likely going to get away with far fewer training data. That sounds great. Um, so why doesn't one always do this? Um, the simple answer is these good approximate physical baseline potentials are hard to come by. They don't generally exist. Um, 
you might think of using empirical false fields, something like that. They're typically system specific, maybe even state point specific. You're generally not going to get your hands on one when you need it for your system of interest. Um, the, the beauty of machine learning potentials in some sense is that their um, agnostic construction allows them to inherit the general applicability from uh, the first principles methods that provide the reference data. And if you start delta learning, then you start to lose this uh, universal applicability. So the question in some sense, once again, becomes what's special about organic mo materials and organic mater uh, molecular crystals. Um, well, they're a bit special in, in, in two ways. One is that the reference calculations are particularly expensive because we need high level first principles, electronic structure calculations for quite sizable systems. And that sets a fairly high bar for what is going to be considered an affordable and therefore useful baseline potential. And the second property they have is that they tend to have very nicely localized electron density. At this point, enter DFTB theory. Uh, Christoph mentioned it. I think he mentioned it as an ab initio method. I'm going to argue that it's uh, not an ab initio method, but a semi-empirical method. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, and I'm no position to introduce the TB theory properly here, but I thought a, a vague outline might be of interest for those that are not familiar with it. Um, so my, my elevator pitch, a short version, the abridged version of what DFTB is, is that it's uh, a semi-empirical electronic structure theory, which, like DFT, can be rendered linear scaling in uh, system size. And for the systems of interest here, for these organic molecular crystals, it's several orders of magnitude uh, less expensive than our uh, first, first principles DFT calculations. And the slightly longer version is uh, the following. If, if you're familiar with DFT, then you're probably familiar with this Cohn-Sham functional that I've written, written down here. Um, in DFTB, what one tends to do is take this energy functional and expand it about some um, reference density n naught. Um, one does so and then rewrites it in a form that is stationary about n naught. And on top of that, one then truncates uh, the energy after the leading order term in, in, in density perturbations delta n. And then to facilitate uh, solving the Kohn-Sham equations that arise from minimizing this energy with respect to the single particle orbitals psi i, one tends to uh, expand those in a basis of local atomic orbitals. Okay, so detail is not so important. What's important is at this point, we still have a theory that is approximate, but uh, it's still agnostic to the system that you're dealing with. Um, however, at this point, the next step is to assume that this uh, darker orange shaded region um, with the Hartree term and the exchange uh, correlation terms and the ein ein coulomb term uh, effectively constitute a short range repulsive two-body potential. And to proceed to fit both that and the lighter yellow region um, to reference data from LDA DFT calculations for suitably chosen sets of reference configurations. And at that point, we're talking about a semi-empirical semi uh, electronics structure method, which isn't universally applicable anymore, but only valid uh, wherever those uh, reference configurations are representative. So that doesn't seem like I've gained much here, and like it should allow me to universally generate machine learning potentials for organic molecular crystals. Um, the fortunate thing is that turns out that for organic molecular crystals, one can uh, actually do this, fitting this parameterization in a way that retains a pretty universal and pretty accurate um, approximate potential for organic molecular systems, uh, molecules, crystals, what have you. Um, slight comment on that or slight correction to that. One at least does if one on top of this parameterization imposes some 
uh, empirical correction for dispersion interactions in a similar way that one might do for D of T. So just to evidence this a bit, on the left-hand side, we're looking at um, D of T B uh, binding energies for a set of molecular crystals. It's the X23 set of molecular crystals, uh, molecular crystals that are bound by hydrogen bonds and or dispersion bound. And uh, there's a comp comparison with uh, experimental data effectively. So there's some sort of uh, sleek extrapolation of uh, experimental data to, um, to raw configurational binding energies going on. Uh, actually, the paper that I mentioned has, has got a more extensive benchmark of this uh, so-called 3OB parameterization of DU2V and its performance for kind of configurational static properties. But from the perspective of performing simulations, I suppose we're also interested in thermodynamic properties and so I mentioned that for the six systems on the right, which are kind of uh, six fairly diverse systems, they, they range from hydrogen bonded to ionically bonded to this to van der Waals bonded systems. They, they, they involve molecular flexibility and configurational disorder and all that. So they're quite representative of general organic molecular crystals. And for these six, uh, if one computes um, equilibrium molar volumes and compares them to experiment, if one does that with path integral isobaric simulations, they should really be directly comparable to experiment. And one finds that one gets errors of say five to 10%. Now, it doesn't seem fantastic, but given their complexity, let's say, um, that is really not so shabby. And if one takes into account that the unit cells in these isobaric simulations tend to undergo fluctuations of similar order of uh, size, 10 percent or so, uh, one can actually hope uh, that in DFTB will, um, or sampling thermodynamic ensemble associated with DFTB will provide useful, uh, informative, representative training data for building a first principles accurate machine learning potential. Okay, so at this point, we've got a universal, uh, approximate and comparatively affordable baseline potentials for building machine learning potentials for organic molecular crystals, which leaves one more slight trick to suggest before showing your first small application. And that's the following. It basically boils down to delta learning again. So say we want to describe our uh, system ultimately at a hybrid functional DFT level of theory, and we'll do so by delta learning on top of DFTB then we might be tempted to simply build a machine learning potential to reproduce this difference. Good and fine, but we might instead also consider uh, first learning the difference between the DFTB baseline and a more affordable semi-local uh, DFT, and then subsequently learning the difference between this more affordable semi-local DFT and the target hybrid functional DFT. Now, the premise of doing this is that learning the difference between DFTB and DFT should be, or semi local DFT should be fairly affordable simply because the semi local DFT calculations are fairly affordable, about an order of magnitude cheaper than the hybrid functional ones. And learning the difference between semi local and hybrid functional DFT will profit from uh, the much smoother target that you're at that point trying to learn. Uh, will require fewer training data and will therefore also be cheaper. So at the expense of having to basically solve an optimization problem, um, that of minimizing the cost of reference calculations with respect to the relative numbers that you perform at the semi-local and at the hybrid functional DFT level, subject to the constraint of having some uh, fixed uh, combined total uh, error in your model, um, you, you basically get away with uh, even fewer slash even cheaper uh, training data generation. Okay. Um, let's put this to, to the test. Uh, let's try and actually determine which polymorph of glycine is thermodynamically stable at ambient conditions. So we've discussed the machine learning potential generation. And uh, with that, uh, we might go ahead and actually compute Gibbs free energies and maybe even correct them back to the first principles levels. This is something that I think Bin Ching will 
um, in part be talking about tomorrow. So I'll kind of skip that part in a moment. Instead, let me show you a workflow that's a bit more representative of what we might actually do. So um, clearly more complex. Uh, what we're doing is we're starting with static representations of the different polymorphs. We're generating a bunch of replicas of each of them by perturbing the simulation cell parameters in a way that uh, kind of produces a distribution of those that is somewhat representative of the fluctuations we expect to see in isobaric simulations. And then we perform short PI NVT simulations using DFTB for all of them. Um, if we trust DFTB enough, uh, we could also have performed probably somewhat longer PI NPT, so isobaric simulations, just for, for each uh, polymorph. But irrespectively, at that point, we start extracting suitable configurations from the accumulated trajectories. Um, We'll do this. We've, we've seen of a few different ways of doing this. For example, Christoph Schrank's, Schrank's uh, active learning strategy might work, or something like a more sophisticated uh, sample selection strategy, as Rose discussed. Here we do something very simple, and we just farthest point sample um, configurations and proceed to compute first principles, energies, and forces for those. And on top of those, we can then go ahead and build some box standard in some sense. Uh, tried and tested Bela Parinello type neural network potentials. Okay, at that point, we're in a spot to perform path integral isobaric simulations and calculate free energies. Since, like I said, I think Binxing will talk about, about this. I'll skip that and jump straight to some results. In this case, results for uh, benzene, succinic acid, and glycine. So if you wish the three compounds among the six that I showed earlier that constitutes something like an irre, um, irreducible set of representatives for general organic molecular crystals. And what we're looking at here are free energy differences between pairs of polymorphs. And we're looking at ones computed solely using the machine learning potential in blue, ones that have subsequently been corrected to the first principles level in red. And then wherever there's data available, there's experimental uh, calorimetry data in green. And so there are basically two points that I want to make here. One is the first principles free energy differences, which rely on machine learned free energy differences as an intermediate step, consistently reproduce the experimentally observed phase behavior. And two, the machine learning based uh, free energy differences uh, reproduce the reference to within about KBT. So this is pretty good news from the perspective of doing uh, stability analysis using machine learning potentials. Okay, I've already spoken 20 minutes, but I'm gonna take a bit more time actually um, to discuss something else that one can do with a suitable baseline potential. And that relates to stabilizing uh, simulations. And for this, we'll need to know how to compute uncertainties. And luckily, Christoph has kind of touched upon this and we've actually touched upon this on Monday as well with Emina's talk. Um, so I'll go through this extremely quickly. Um, if we were to use something like a sparse Gaussian process regression model to build our potentials, we could have theoretically compute uncertainties and we wouldn't have to estimate them. But in practice, that involves uh, some annoying uh, matrix product. So that uh, that is usually foregone in terms of uncertainty estimation strategies. And Christoph mentioned the probably most common one, which is these comity-based uncertainty estimates. Um, to add to what he said, uh, two things. One, bringing back up what Emina said, basically, um, one has to worry a bit about how one construct, uh, actually construct these comities in order to ensure that there's no excessive biases. Um, depending on whether one does this with neural network potentials or Gaussian process regression potentials, one might follow slightly different strategies with a neural network potential uh, since they are dependent on the initial weights uh, and are trained in stochastic fashion. Usually one can for better or for worse, uh, just train a bunch of them on the 
exact same training data using different initializations and call it good. Um, if one does it with something like a Gaussian process regression model, which I effectively trained in a deterministic way, uh, one is probably uh, in a position where one has to do some sort of subsampling of the training data and train multiple models on different subsets of the training data. Um, either way, one's going to take something like one's going to take the standard deviation over predictions from members, and one is going to translate it in general into an uncertainty estimate. And I say translate it and not use it as, because if you think about the case of subsampling, you can probably imagine that depending on which kind of size of subset of the training data I used to build my models on, I'll get uh, more widely spread predictions or more narrowly spread predictions. So we're not going to assume that this spread is representative of the uncertainty per se, but we're going to make the assumption, which is still not generally a true assumption, but often a good assumption, that this spread of predictions from the different members um, is consistent across configurations and that we can uh, get an uncertainty estimate out simply by scaling the standard de deviation of predictions from different members of the committee by some scaling factor alpha. And, and this factor alpha we can evaluate if we have a validation set, for example, uh, simply by maximum like um, lock likelihood maximization. So we can uh, maximize the likelihood of observing the errors for a validation set with respect to this scaling factor alpha. If we're actually doing this in a subsampling approach, we might arrive at a slightly more complicated expression, but it ends up not being particularly complicated. After all, it's going to depend on the number of subsampling models. OK, so let's assume we roughly know how to determine uncertainties, and we're aware that there are certain risks attached to these comity schemes. How can we use that to stabilize simulations? The basic idea is to take our baseline potential and only correct it with the delta learned machine learning correction when we trust that delta learning correction, so our machine learning potential. So at the top, we've got this potential B where we've just taken the baseline potential and added the mean of the different machine learning committee members flat out. That has the, the usual issues of becoming unstable when it starts extrapolating. At the bottom, we've instead got a potential U of X where we've taken the baseline potential and we're uh, adding the correction in a weighted fashion, weighted depending on the configuration that one is currently looking at. And this weighting factor takes into account the uncertainty in the machine learning prediction for that given configuration. The way it is defined is in a way that has the right desired properties. Um, it goes to one when the uncertainty is practically zero, or goes to zero. Um, and it decays very quickly when the uncertainty in the machine learning prediction exceeds this quantity sigma b and then eventually goes to zero, meaning that one ends up sampling just using the baseline potential. Um, so this is the question of how to define sigma b. And sigma b, we basically interpret as the uncertainty of the baseline potential itself. So the error in the baseline, the typical error in the baseline potential with respect to the reference. And accordingly, we can compute it uh, basic, uh, as the standard deviation of um, um, the, the baseline with respect to the reference for our training data, for example. Um, this. Uh, means that sigma b is agnostic to any constant offsets uh, between, say, the baseline potential and and uh, the reference potential, which is a likely scenario. Okay, so using this weighted baseline scheme, we claim we can stabilize simulations, and we can do so in particular in cases where our simulations are inevitably going to explore the extrapolative regime of the machine learning potentials. And so let me show you one example of that, and then I'll finish. And that is the example of exploring the free energy surface of a tripeptide using replica exchange molecular dynamics. So here again, we've got a DFTB baseline and a little ensemble of Bilaparinello neural network potentials to apply a correction to 
achieve hopefully close to uh, DFT uh, level of accuracy. So the, the interesting thing here is that we're going to perform this replica exchange molecular dynamic simulation uh, with replicas reaching as high as two and a half thousand Kelvin. But the training data is A, not going to be for the true peptide, but for a bunch of uh, dipeptides, which have again been simulated using replica exchange, but temperatures uh, only reaching about 1,000 Kelvin. So effectively, we're generalizing from the dipeptides to the tripeptides, and we're generalizing from low temperature to very high temperature. And so ine inevitably, we end up uh, ex extrapolating. OK, so what I'm actually showing you in this plot here, this plot is showing you a set of structures extracted from uh, a long-ish replica exchange uh, molecular dynamic simulation for this tripeptide. And on the x and y axis, we've got some sort of structural principle components that distinguish the different uh, configurations that we extracted. On the z axis, we've got temperature, and then we've colored them according to the weight uh, that has been applied to the machine learning correction to the DFTB baseline uh, for any of these points. And so what we're seeing here is that at the bottom left, um, for low temperatures, uh, we basically have different conformers of the intact tree peptide. And the weights are high, uh, unsurprisingly, because the local environments that this tree peptide explores or exhibits are represented in our training data. But then as we get to higher temperatures, around, say, 500 Kelvin or so, we start burning off CO2. And eventually, at around 1,000 Kelvin, we, we also get water and NH3 and, and a few other fragments. Um, and at that point, the weights decay dramatically, which is also unsurprising because those chemical reactions, if you wish, aren't represented at all in our training data. Nonetheless, the simulation remains stable. Um, we've only realistically sampled the true peptide with DFT accuracy in the low temperature regime and effectively sampled it at DFTB accuracy and high temperature regime. But if you're interested, if we're interested, for example, in just the low temperature behavior and the low temperature thermodynamic uh, ensemble, then this is perfectly fine. And if we are interested in the higher temperature regime, then we could now take the configuration that we have explored and try and add them to our training data. And the final thing I want to say is, if you try and run the same kind of simulation with a plain machine learning corrected uh, baseline without this weighting approach, then these simulations explode very, very quickly. Okay, so I think this is hopefully quite an impressive way of demonstrating the power of these weighted baseline approaches, and I'll finish with that. Um, maybe I'll do the same as Christoph and see whether there are any questions that I should answer straight away before trying to pull up my little uh, demonstration of some of this. Okay, I think Siddharth is raising a hand. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, great talk. Um, so I just wanted to uh, just get a hold or just get an understanding of uh, uh, how you construct these committee models and um, how do you make use of them to get uh, the MD committee integration? Mm -hmm. Okay. So did you, did you follow what Christoph suggested in terms of evaluating or estimating uncertainties in a committee prediction? Um, not really. OK, so there, there are different ways of looking at it. One is from the Gaussian process regression standpoint. And at that point, I would probably call in Max to try and uh, explain it to you, because he's probably better at doing that. Um, but from a neural network point of view, uh, you might be familiar with the fact that if you train a set of them, initializing them from different weights, then you're likely to end up uh, on different points on this um, hypersurface uh, that is the loss function as a function of the weights. Um, and so effectively, by initializing them differently, you end up getting different models that make different predictions. The hope is 
And I think Amina pointed out that if one does exactly that, it's a bit of a hope. But the hope is that if um, whatever you're predicting on is already represented well by your training data, then these different models will end up predicting very similar values of, in this case, energies and forces. Um, but otherwise, they might disagree heavily. And so, as Christoph pointed it, um, uh, yeah, um, worded it, this committee disagreement is what we're going to translate into an uncertainty measure. And then what we practically do in this weighted baseline molecular dynamics or path integral molecular dynamics is we take the baseline and we add the correction subject to a, a weighting factor. The weighting factor, which is going to be one if the uncertainty in our commutative prediction is zero and is going to drop away as the uncertainty in our commutative prediction becomes significant. Okay. Did that clarify it a bit? Yeah, I think it, and like, yeah, it's just that, uh, uh, so all the committee models are, are models that are, uh, are uh, uh, trained using the same data set, but with, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, with, with, that, with just different orientation or shuffling, right? So in this case, yes. Okay. But yeah. as Emina pointed out on Monday, that might not be a good thing to do in general. It, it happens to work here. Uh, but in general, one should probably be careful with how one constructs uh, these committees of models and should do okay. it in, in, in a different way. But but she's probably the better person to, to ask about this than me. I'm probably more familiar with the idea of subsampling training data, at which point you can kind of imagine how using different subsets of the training data to build models on reflects the um, limitations of your training data. Right. Yeah, I think that helps. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I think correct me if I'm wrong, Elena, but I didn't see any other raised hands. No, I don't I didn't see okay. any either. So in that case, let me quickly talk you through this uh, deep note notebook. Um, I hope it's all fairly intuitive and I'll I'll go quickly so we might have a few more minutes for questions at the end and uh, let you play with it otherwise. But the notebook basically starts from a training set for benzene. So it kind of skips the part of doing DFTB sampling and extracting uh, suitable configurations and performing the first principles reference calculations. I suppose it would be a bad idea to do this on DeepNote. Um, so it starts with the training set and it starts building uh, models. It actually doesn't build the Laparinello neural network models as I was doing for the purpose of my two examples in the talk. Instead, it does what uh, I guess Felix uh, was showing you, and that is built uh, gap models using the LibRuskal framework. Um, okay, we start off here basically by reiterating things that Felix probably has discussed already, which is how to get LibRuskal and install it. Um, on top of that, in this case, um, we'll actually be looking at running simulations, and we're going to do this using the IPy code. The IPy code works together with other codes in the sense that it does the propagation of the system, for instance, uh, according to um, Newton's equations of motion, if we're doing molecular dynamics or accordingly differently if we're doing path integral molecular dynamics um, and exchanges configurations with slave codes in return for energies and forces so basically provides a configuration to the slave code the slave code has the task of evaluating the energy and forces and return it to ipi and then ipi will use the energies and forces to do the propagation and finally there's a uh, dftb that we'll need um, so they I, I believe and these should be installed on deep note and that should run in the terminal if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not gonna try it right now. Instead, um, we'll instead go through the generation of the machine learning potentials first, which um, is gonna look familiar. We're gonna import uh, ASE to deal with our structure data. We're gonna import various 
uh, Ruskell or Lib Ruskell um, functions to actually uh, build the models. And we're actually going to also import uh, a linear regression or ridge regression uh, model from sklearn simply, as we'll see in a bit, to evaluate uh, kind of atomic energies. Um, so this notebook is based on a set of training data that should be in data, if I'm not mistaken. And it will be there in terms of a lib atom for ASE style set of configurations. Mm. If DeepNode wants to open up. So here we've got some this benzene underscore train underscore FPS of XYZ. That's a set of ASE lib atom style configurations with energies and forces attached. Here we've got a couple of functions just to extract those. First thing we're going to do is split them into training, validation, and test. We explicitly use a validation set just to avoid having to do cross validation for the purposes of keeping this simple. And then we go through the simple exercise of building a standalone gap model, which implies extracting as um, training data the, in this case, um, it's going to be. PBE DFT energies and PBE DFT forces. So this part of the notebook should probably look familiar from Tuesday from Felix's talk, if I remember correctly. Um, slight subtlety, extracting out atomic energies and only learning binding energies, if you wish. Uh, for these benzene configurations, they all have equal uh, equal fractions of hydrogen and carbon. You could just um, divide the total energies by the number of atoms in each uh, configuration and thereby get an atom atomic energy. Or in a more general case, you might want to build something like a dressed atom model where you do a little linear regression to associate a suitable per atom energy with a different species in your system. And this is what's happening here. Um, usually I do this with a linear regression because of this equal number of carbons and hydrogens here. Uh, linear regression gives me very different per atom energies for the two and it's kind of an uh, underdetermined system. So I'm kind of using rich regression just to regularize this a bit. Okay, so far so good. We follow through. Uh, we define a set of hyperparameters for the representation of these structures. In the same way that we did on Tuesday, we build a structure manager on top of that and we feed that into, well, we select a set of representative environments from our training data to build a sparse Gaussian process regression or a sparse model on. Here, this is done with a CUR selection that you should at this point also be familiar with from Rose's talk. Um, and then we end up actually building the model and saving it. Uh, you see, for, for the example that I've got here, this should be fairly quick, even though I'm not running it right now. OK, now we do a bit of testing using our, in this case, uh, straight out the, the test set. We look at energy and force, root mean square errors, and, and, and fractional errors. And we end up getting a model that's got you know, 6.4 MeV energy error. and. 342 MeV per angstrom force error. So, so we might hope to get stable dynamics out of this. So if we do try this, well, first I'm plotting the correlation just to check that that's everything looks reasonable and then a huge outliers. Um, and we're skipping the, we could construct a learning curve as a function of the number of active points, but that's probably also not the point here. So instead we'll, at that point, uh, run some NVT simulations. And we see that we can, so in, in this example, we can do this as a, there's a run script um, in simulations, I believe, um, that, that basically tells you how, how this is practically done. Um, and you've, you've got the relevant inputs and outputs. 
um, I'll be around a bit. I, I'm skipping through this quickly, quickly, but if you've got questions about this at a later point when you actually try and do this for yourself, let me know and I'll try and get back to you. Uh, the point is, if we run this simulation, we get uh, eventually get an output with various energies and the conserved quantity, time step, and so on and so forth. And we can start plotting these. And for the simple standalone model, we find that for this training data, we end up not getting a stable simulation. It ends up blowing up um, comparatively quickly um, within less than a picosecond. OK, we can do a bit better and build a delta learning model. We'll do exactly what we just did again, except this time, as our targets, we'll extract the differences between the DFT and the DFTB energies and the differences between the DFT and the DFTB forces. And we will use those as our training data. Otherwise, we do exactly the same thing. We recalculate uh, atomic energies because they'll now be different since we're looking at the difference of rather than the absolute uh, DFT energies. And we can, again, assess the model in terms of energy and force RMSEs, which have dropped substantially by about a factor of five. Notably, the fractional error isn't any better. It's just that our variance in, in, in this differences in energies and differences in forces is much smaller to start with. So at this point, we, we might certainly hope that this model should provide stable dynamics. Um, if, again, we run NVT simulations, this seems to be the case. That's great. But we might be interested in running isobaric calculations. And if we play that game, we notice that even Though we've got very nice small energy and force RMSEs, we end up getting unstable simulations. In essence, this is because uh, the training data that I've provided um, is, has cell volumes that are somewhat smaller than the equilibrium cell volume that DFT favors. And so it's not particularly representative. OK, fin final, final step here. Building a model, uh, building a committee model first. Uh, same procedure, except building it on subsets of the training data and assessing it, first of all, gives us basically the same energy and force RMSEs. Unsurprisingly, we're training the same kind of models on the same kind of data other than this subsampling. Um, but ultimately, we're averaging over models, so there we go. And finally, this comity model, we can also take and try and use to evaluate uncertainties. So here we're evaluating the scaling factor that translates the standard deviations into uncertainties, roughly speaking. And we can now compare the estimated uncertainties is this alpha we've that, that's where we've actually made use of the validation set so that now we can compare the un estimated uncertainties with the observed residual errors for the test set and that might look something like this here so is that reasonable at all well um basically you ex the, the point is you expect about two thirds of your residual errors to be uh, smaller than the one sigma uncertainty estimate. You expect about 95 uh, to be smaller than the, twice the uncertainty estimate and less than a percent to be smaller than uh, three times the uncertainty estimate. These are actually the fractions I've listed here. And it turns out that our error distribution is a bit heavy tailed. So our uncertainty estimates are a bit small. But the fact that we've got the scatter going over into the upper triangle of, the dis of, of, of this plot here when we're plotting uh, uncertainty estimates with the versus actual errors is unsurprising, right? Because oftentimes uh, our actual observed error should be smaller than the one sigma uncertainty estimate. OK, final plot, NPT simulations using DFTB as a baseline and this comedy model in weighted fashion to correct our simulation 
And at that point, even in the isobaric simulations, we actually get a stable simulation. Um, not only do we get a stable simulation, we can check whether we've actually corrected our DFTB potential at any given point and not just effectively run a DFTB simulation in terms of the weights. We can look at the distribution of the weights and that should look something like this in this case, meaning they're generally not one, but they're a large part of one. So most of the time we've uh, largely collect, corrected from DFTB to DFT. And the final thing I've got in this notebook at the bottom is uh, the plain DFTB uh, simulation, just to show you here, the equilibrium volume for DFT, uh, DFTB is, I'm um, gonna make it 220 or so cubic angstrom compared to uh, closer to the DFT equilibrium volume that we get from our weighted, base, uh, weighted baseline simulation, which is closer to 240 cubic angstrom. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry I had to rush through the exercise a bit, but I hope it's annotated such that um, everyone can go through it and actually uh, run it step by step as well. The, the actual simulations that, you, that get you to the point of observing instability or getting a good understanding of the fact that simulations are stable might actually take a bit longer than a few minutes in practice. Uh, since, and in some sense, unlike what uh, Christoph suggested, DFTB can become expensive as well if one goes to large enough uh, structures and large enough unit cells. Right. Thank you, Edgar. Um, I, I guess there is time for questions then. Um, 10 minutes or so. So and anyone, uh, go ahead. And if there isn't at the moment, I was wondering if you could go over the um, uncertainty estimation versus actual error plot. I didn't mm -hmm. quite understand. My, so my, my understanding was that um, you're expecting the uncertainty estimate to be correlated with the actual error, and that's why you can see well, if that, that's why you can like, kind of if this is always uh, the error. If this is what everybody initially thinks, including myself, and then mm. you realize if it was actually cor correlated, right, then you could correct. The yeah. Error. So you don't expect it to be correlated. Unfortunately, you, you correct the distributions to be related. Right? Uh huh. The, the uncertainty estimate tells you something about the expected distribution of errors. You see what I mean? So if, if I have an uncertainty estimate of one sigma, then I expect a distribution, let's say it's roughly normal, where mm -hmm. most of the time I'll get errors that are within plus or minus one sigma and fewer times will be within plus or minus two sigma and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't have a measure of what the error actually will be. I can just say okay. that two thirds of the time, it'll be less than my estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, and 95% of the time, it'll be less than twice mm -hmm. my estimate, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And so you basically expect the actual errors to largely populate this, this upper triangle in this plot, where the, um, where the actual error is smaller than the uncertainty estimate, with, with about one third spilling over into the lower triangle and smaller fractions uh, sp spilling over into these lower parts of the lower triangle. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, so So it's basically the, the, this part. Um, so basically that, that, that kind of justifies why you can still use uncertainty estimates. So even if you can't predict the actual error, you know that it's it, it gives you a bound of what you might that's, expect. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. I think in the um, in the paper that is hopefully yeah. I 
think it's this one here, I need to cross track, um, which basically introduced the idea of um, subsampling methods for uncertainty estimation. Mm -hmm. um, they, they plot this distribution in a slightly different way that it actually compares the expected and the actual distribution. So given the uncertainty estimate, you can start um, constructing the uh, corresponding distribution of errors, the expected distribution of errors, and you can compare that to the actual distribution of errors directly. Mm. So you can, you can have a look at that. I'm not sure it's more instructive, a plot. It's still a bit tricky to read, I would mm. say. Um, but that, that gives you a different perspective on the same thing. And couldn't you, so once you have this, um, once you know the actual relationship between the estimated uncertainty and the actual error distribution, would, would you have that inform, like, when you trust the model and when you don't? So let's say initially, you, um, like basically a, a factor for your sigma b over sigma b plus another sigma like so could the, you be adjust depending on how it act like how actually these depending on how actually these distributions are related um well once you actually once you actually run your simulations you won't have the residual errors anymore right so there's basically a sanity check that you mm -hmm. do on the basis of you know, the validation slash test set uh, to confirm that what you're evaluating as uncertainty estimates is somehow representative of the ones mm -hmm. you see out of training mm -hmm. Uh, once you actually perform the simulations, right, you don't have the residual errors anymore, and you have to trust your uncertainty estimates. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, if you, if you if you perform some sort of uncertain, uh, some sort of active learning strategy, I guess you could continuously keep track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I was thinking I think. about like reevaluating them again. And... Yeah, yeah. I think that would be very interesting to do. Exactly. Uh, in this case, the idea is that you you build a model once and then uh, mm -hmm. extended simulations for it, and you kind of don't do the conventional online active learning where every time mm -hmm. you come on uh, an unknown configuration your simulation blows up or something goes terribly wrong and then you have to retrain and run again the mm -hmm. idea is uh, if, if you're doing some sort of uh, active learning then it'll be more like an offline active learning where you uh, run longer simulations um, kind of smoothly interpolating between the corrected potential and the mm -hmm. baseline potential and then mm -hmm. include in batches configurations where you ended up just using the baseline potential because your correction ended up being uh, not, not mm -hmm. physical or uh, untrustworthy. Yeah, it's, it, it, it was quite surprising to see that um, when you do you trust the correction all the time, it actually messes up your simulation. Like mine too, mine is so, very thing. limited. Sorry? I, I mean, I've, I've set up in, in, in both, both in the notebook here as well as in the example, we, we've got somewhat particular setup. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. In one case, uh, the application, so here in, in, in the tripeptide example, the application is uh, from the outset uh, going to involve some sort of extrapolation simply because you're going from dipeptide training data to a tripeptide application and because you're going from low temperature to high temperature. Mm -hmm. so that you're, you're inevitably going to start extrapolating. Mm -hmm. In the notebook, it's a bit more subtle, but, um, because in both cases, you're looking at the same uh, benzene unit cells um, at ambient temperature, well, it's at mm -hmm. Kelvin, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so that's less obvious why you'd end up extrapolating, and why you'd end up needing this fallback potential. And, and the reason it arises in practice is because of this discrepancy in equilibrium uh, density between the DFTB baseline that has provided the training data and the DFT target mm -hmm. that you're trying to, to correct to. So as you correct, your system wants to uh, expand a bit. And as it expands, the training data becomes less and less representative and you run into, again, extrapolation. Yeah. And then the trick is that you catch that right, and fall back to some degree. At least when, when, when I mean, okay, so the training data is somewhat representative, otherwise we wouldn't get weights that are, um, say, peaked around the 80% mark. Mm -hmm. um, but when, whenever you get a really uh, not well-represented co 
which happens more often than you can get away with without baselining, without this weighting, um, then, then you end up kind of dialing down the correction and falling back on the baseline. So it's not like these simulations don't run at all when you apply mm -hmm. the full correction, mm -hmm. they just go up within a bigger seconds, probably less. Well, I think we've seen in the example that it's, it's not quite that, it's of the order of picoseconds or so, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. Are there any last questions from the audience? I guess if not, um, thank you, Edgar, very much for the talk. Yeah. Um, there's a dedicated channel on Slack if anyone has any follow-up questions. I'll and try and keep track. Um, I have to excuse myself for later today. Absolutely. I've really got teaching commitments as well, which I'll take into my time. But I'll try and keep track of the channel in case there are any yeah. later questions. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. And we re recollect ourselves <laughs> in 20 minutes.